Thank you very much, Michael. And um, I'd also like to thank the um, Military Officers Association, um, the Association of the United States Army, and of course, AHAC for hosting us here today. What I'd like to be um, discussing today is an event that has just come about in its initial form within the last month and a half, when Britain had, as some called it, its Independence Day of January um, 31st, 2020, when it uh, left the European Union. Now, the European Union itself, as you can see here, is a broad encompassing body of member states extending from Western Europe through the old Soviet bloc, the new, the new members, as they're called, and up into Scandinavia, and also include, included the United Kingdom um, until just this year. Across the European Union, it's a organization that has primarily a degree of an economic mission, of economic freedom of movement of individuals, free trade among the members, a common regulatory policy where everyone agrees to have similar regulatory rules and restrictions, and ones where, say, financial capital can move smoothly between countries as well. And it's able to do this on a relatively um, small budget of about, at the central organization, of about 1% of European gross domestic product. So it's a relatively weak supranational organization, one in which the member states retain substantial power. But for many members, they have some frictions and concerns about what membership has meant for them. And we've seen in the United States, in Europe, Latin America, and elsewhere in recent years a rise of a variety of issues, some linked to globalization, the increased exposure of domestic economies to international market forces, the um, rise of trade competition from other countries, and migration, which is something that we certainly see in this country, but we also see within the European Union. And many people in Europe, the United States and elsewhere, have gotten frustrated, frustrated with their economic lot, frustrated with what they see as undesirable social changes, and a dissatisfaction with the directions in which their countries were headed. Now, previously, Britain had been relatively immune from these pressures, in part because of the structure of its political system. Like the United States, Britain has governments that are elected on a first-past-the-post electoral system. So it's whoever gets the most votes in a particular constituency becomes the member of parliament, just as whoever has the most votes within a constituency here becomes a member of Congress or a, um, or a, um, a senator, say. They don't need to have a majority, just more than any other individual candidates. Most other European countries did not have this sort of arrangement in their national parliaments. They would have a proportional system where if you got 40% of the vote, you'd get about 40% of the seats in the parliament. And if you got 15% of the vote, you'd get about 15% of the seats. Now, this provided a pretty major barrier to small parties. Why we in the United States pretty much only have two parties. Every now and again, you know, some billionaire will come along and fund himself and, you know, maybe push himself to 19% of the vote. But that is, but the two-party system is quite resilient in that regard because they're typically competitive in every state and you have to go over a pretty sizable barrier to push one of them out. And the same is true in the United Kingdom. There are some regional parties that are important because they had regional strength in, say, Scotland or Northern Ireland for peculiar reasons uh, related to their local politics. But on the whole, there were two major parties, the um, Conservative Party and the Labour Party, with a small 
Liberal Party as well that occasionally won um, seats. But this provided Britain with typically majoritarian governments over time and prevented populist parties or radical left-wing parties from gaining a foothold in the corridors of power or from being um, participants in a coalition government, issues that occasionally confronted governments on the continent. The Germans would increasingly have to face this with either governments, uh, especially at the state level, of the far left or far right, but it was not restricted to them. But it contains within itself a very deep vulnerability that if a minor party can make enough inroads into the votes for a major party, then that major party has got to try to figure a way to co-opt them or risk losing power. Now, for European elections in the United Kingdom, they did have a proportional representation system. And you can see here what happened in 2014. A party which was not a major party, didn't have any seats in parliament, the UK Independence Party won over a quarter of the vote, became the largest party from the United Kingdom in the European Parliament. It was um, led by a guy named Nigel Farage. Um, those of you who listened to NPR a few weeks ago might have heard, and this is a direct result of Nigel Farage, who was you know, had a large degree of popularity in some areas and a lack of popularity in other areas, particularly among younger uh, voters. Um, if you'd been listening to NPR, I think it was about a month ago, you'll have heard there was a, a story, I, I see you nodding, um, that not a single child in Britain in uh, 2016 was named Nigel. Uh, that's a pretty quintessential British name. Um, and so this was considered rather a direct result of uh, his unpopularity writ large among the younger generation, but writ large among the population, the ideas of the UK Independence Party, which were that Britain should withdraw from the European Union, should reclaim its sovereignty, should keep immigrants out, and it should pursue its own independent trade regulatory policies, was fairly popular. Now, we would think 26% of the vote, while a substantial amount, is not enough to normally win an American election, let alone a British election. And the then opposition Labour Party, the party of the left of center, the party of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, won 24%. The Conservatives, who were the governing party, got 23%. The Scottish National Party, it's 2.4%, but very strong in Scotland, well over 40%. In fact, they win a majority there. And their, their success plays a role in the story as it develops. Plaid Cymru is the uh, Welsh Nationalist Party, um, and then, of course, the Liberal Democrats, the Green Party and others won some, some seats there as well. But the important feature here is that from the right, the Conservative Party was coming under pressure from the UK Independence Party. There was a big strand within the Conservative Party that was resistant to deeper European integration, and they saw themselves hemorrhaging votes over on their right to the UK Independence Party. And this was followed up shortly thereafter by a general election. And you can see here, the Conservatives don't do especially well. You need 326 seats, uh, 325, 26, um, to form a government. And the Conservatives barely got a majority. They had been in coalition with the Liberal Democrats, who lost heavily. But even though the UK Independence Party, 12.7%, got only one seat, this was enough to throw a large number of seats to the opposition Labour Party. And as with the United States, there's a great deal of concern in working class areas, in areas that were suffering economic distress, areas that typically voted slightly left of center to support this party. So it really extinguished any chances the conservatives had of making inroads into those areas. And of course, the Scottish National Party does extraordinarily well, winning 56 out of um, 72 seats in Scotland. They also win elections in the Scottish Parliament, a separate body. And this 
poses quite a crisis for the very narrowly based conservative government of David Cameron. In Scotland, they have a party that's pledged to independence for Scotland that has just won both an election with the vast majority of seats to Westminster, the national parliament, and to the, par the Scottish parliament in um, Edinburgh. So this put them in quite a bind and really did not have too much of a, a choice with such an overwhelming popular mandate that had a majoritarian backing. And the government of David Cameron felt that they, they would try and lance this boil, and they held an independence referendum in Scotland. And, the camp, and all the major parties, except the Scottish National Party, got together to poll for keeping Scotland as part of the United Kingdom. Their slogan was, you know, we're better off together. They had former prime ministers from the Labour Party, who was Scottish, Gordon Brown campaigning, prominent liberal Democrats and prominent um, uh, conservatives all arguing the case to keep Scotland in the United Kingdom. And one of the arguments they made was, Scotland, if you go your own way, there's no guarantee you're in the European Union. You're going to have to apply as a new outside country and, you know, no guarantee, all bets are off. Well, they won the referendum. Scott, the the um, Remain within the UK um, group, the establishment group, the Scottish Nationalists failed and the Scottish Nationalists had put this as a once in a lifetime, once in a generation vote. And the conservative government felt, well, this, we've done the trick. We've um, told these, we've seen off the threat of Scottish nationalism, at least for a generation, and this solves our Scottish problem. However, they still had another problem, and that was with the UK Independence Party. And I think, and th there was no need to have a referendum on the issue of staying in the European Union, but David Cameron, and I think what a lot of commentators, and including David Cameron, have felt was a serious mistake, but uh, in, in knowing in hindsight what happened and what he wanted, um, decided to hold a referendum on British membership in the European Union. And Cameron felt that he would win this one at least as overwhelmingly as they had won the Scottish referendum, and that this would lance the boil of British nationalism and put that to rest for a generation as well, that this would repeat the successful playbook of Scotland to the UK writ large. So a government that did not want to have UK independence from the European Union decided to hold a referendum with precisely that possible outcome. And so the campaign kicked off. I've got some examples here of the sorts of media coverage that you had, the sort of campaigns. This is on the Leave side. For, and there were various different attitudes and groups. They're not necessarily consistent. They're not consistent on either side. But on this side, um, you have concerns from the left that Europe is a capitalist racket. It's about free markets. It's about capitalism. It's about low taxes. It prevents us from doing national policies to promote British workers, to revitalize British industry. And it is holding us back. That's the left-wing version of anti-Europeanism. The right-wing version of anti-Europeanism is European Union's holding us back, European red tape is tying up British industry and British capitalism. If we could be unleashed, we will be a um, Atlantic tiger economy, the Singapore of the um, North Sea, and Britain will you know, be unleashed and be able to take full advantage of all of its um, uh, in inherent entrepreneurial, although the word is French, entrepreneurial spirit, and be able to outcompete those Europeans who are tied up in all their red tape. So you can see how they both want, both those sorts of ideas want out of the European Union, but they're not at all consistent with each other. Um, and you can see the left-wing version here has paying the National Health Service, Britain's Universal Healthcare Service, taking all the money that went to Europe, a lot of which came back to the UK, and um, paying it to the National Health Service instead, which was considered a bit of a, uh, you know, a bit of a problem. That, that this, as with every every country, right? You know, healthcare is always always a problem, no matter where you are. Um, but in Britain as well, they have gripes 
about that. There's also concern about immigration. And the immigration that largely occurred in Britain was from other European countries, from Poland or Lithuania, relatively lower wage countries, attracting people into Britain to perform um, jobs. And there was concern about that. Also migration from um, the Middle East um, uh, and Africa as, as well. Um, and so that was more of a, uh, uh, so, so there was a, a demographic and immigration concern, I think one of which we're familiar with in this country as well. I've um, put up three pictures from the big tabloid, most popular tabloid in the UK, very, the right-wing tabloid. It's owned by the Murdoch Press. Um, the British tabloids are, slight, are much more prominent, uh, the British papers are much more prominent and influential than the American ones are, um, in that they almost all, all the big ones have a national subscription base rather than being concentrated in, say, New York City or Washington, D.C., or so forth. Um, the Sun is owned by Rupert Murdoch. And so they would say things like, you know, the Queen backs Brexit. Probably neither true nor untrue. The Queen has no political opinions, at least officially. Um, you know, and then believe in Britain. They're always very clever um, there. And there's Independence Day, which I was always a bit dubious about when I saw that one, because it, I mean, if you, you've seen the movie Independence Day, right? And usually what then happened when the big light came up is they then obliterated what, the aliens obliterated what was below it. So I wasn't sure that was quite what the sun wanted to convey, but that's what they had uh, there. Now, on the Remain side, they had their own campaign as well. And they argued, also, there were left-wing and right-wing versions of the Remain campaign, one and, and also sort of ones that were appealing to emotions. There was, well, if you have more jobs and lower prices because you'll have this access to the broad European market that you'll have restricted access to, won't be able to export as much, that's going to keep out uh, employment, and if you have more competition, you'll have lower um, prices because lower price products will come in from places that are able to produce things elsewhere in Europe more efficiently. So that would be an attraction, right? Um, and then, you know, then there's stronger in Europe, which is sort of hearkening back to, you know, we're stronger together in the Scotland campaign. Um, and then, obviously, elements of of, of risk there. In the lower left-hand corner are some of the prominent leave, um, or, or, so prominent and not so popular advocates of the leave campaign, including Boris Johnson, Nicholas Farage, Michael Govey, and Duncan Smith, who um, were, uh, again, relatively unpopular. And to, the t to the extent they could be latched onto in this was seen as a uh, element of, of you know, the, these are the guys who support leaving, and then look at all these establishment figures, reliable, steady people um, um, who would um, be supporting you, know, you staying in, David Cameron, Tony Blair, John Major, all of the former leaders. Now, the, other, the, the Leave campaign would say, much as Donald Trump did, those are the villains that got us into this mess. This is why we have trouble with jobs. This is why we have trouble with migration. We have trade deals and European arrangements that don't help us, and it's those guys' fault. That's the, you know, the standard populist playbook, but it certainly was the basis of their campaign and the popular concern. You know, these are legitimate popular concerns that were otherwise unaddressed by the political system. So these are not, in that regard, illegitimate in any way. And in the upper right, I've included the endorsement of the Times, the premier establishment paper that endorsed Remain. It also, by the way, is owned by Rupert Murdoch. Um, and, uh, and, the, the, and, and Rupert Murdoch has a similar media strategy, started in Australia, um, perfected in Britain, and then taken to the United States. And the newspaper side of it is to have a, national, as have a, a big tabloid. It's the Sun in Britain. It's the, Washington, sorry, the New York Post in the United States. And then a quality press in the capital, the Times in the UK, and the Wall Street Journal in the US. And you can think in the US, the Wall Street Journal has a different attitude about trade deals, international finance, than the New York Post does. And the same with the Sun and the Times. They each have their own segment of the market that they appeal to. But both the Times and the Sun 
and the Post and the Wall Street Journal endorsed, in one regard, Donald Trump and the other, um, the um, conservative, conservative Party. So here you can see the breakdown of the vote in the 2015 election and the, also the breakdown of the vote at the end of the, le of the um, referendum campaign. And you can see Scotland and Northern Ireland voted um, to uh, remain, and much of England, outside of the urban areas, voted to leave. And that corresponds relatively closely with areas where the Conservative Party was strong, but also where they were under threat from the UK Independence Party. Now, when the UK had had an earlier referendum in 1979, also on Scottish independence, and they'd set the rules slightly differently than a 50% plus one in your out vote. Um, in 1979, the Thatcher government had not really wanted to have a um, independent Scotland, so they wanted not simply a majority of Scotland to vote for it, but they set a minimum participation threshold that was very unlikely to be met, and it was not. Um, but rather than have a similar sort of, you know, Jimmy arrangement, where saying, you know, that um, three of the four regions of England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, a majority, had to vote to leave for such a major constitutional change, they allowed it to be a simple majority. England has the vast majority of the population of the United Kingdom. Leaving the European Union was relatively popular in England, and that's what carried the day. And just as a note, um, because the, I mean, the rules do matter, 51.8% of the vote, which gets you out of the European Union, is about the same ratio of votes between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And Hillary Clinton didn't end up president because we have a different system of rules, right, with the Electoral College. Um, it's not simply straight up majoritarian. So that comes out as the result. Quite a shock for the British establishment, very much what the business leaders, the party leaders of the major parties, the labor leaders had not at all wanted. But they felt themselves bound to follow through. And keep in mind, the conservative government at this time has a very narrow majority, many of whose members had been, including the prime minister, had campaigned in favor of staying in the European Union. So the Prime Minister had campaigned to stay in the European Union, had lost his signature policy in one, you know, a major policy setback, felt, rightly so, that he could not then see this through. So he resigned, and he was replaced by Theresa May, um, who likewise had supported remaining in, but she'd not been at the forefront of the campaign. And she held an election saying, well, only the Conservatives can deliver this, and I'll promise you, if you vote for me, it'll be a strong and, and stable government. And um, the result was a bit of a shrug. The conservative government actually lost seats um, as, uh, uh, um, in, in the election. They, they got under a majority, and they had to rely upon the support of an Irish party. The Irish parties are typically divided between the Protestant and Catholic segments. There's a, a sort of a, um, a joint denominational party that had been growing in, in strength of late, but the Protestant party very firmly wants to remain part of the United Kingdom. And the, they're called the, uh, the um, Ulster Unionist Party, uh, Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland, and they had 10 seats. But that poses some very curious problems for a British government, especially when not used to having coalitions, because one of the major sticking points, as you'll see, in problem areas um, for um, European, uh, for leaving the European Union, is going to be in Ireland, the only area where the UK shares a substantial border with the European Union, and where there are very clear differences. So, the, the joke afterwards was, well, with the 10 votes from the Irish Unionists, the um, conservatives had a stable government with 327 seats, um, but it was weak and stable rather than strong and stable because they were highly dependent upon the um, um, Irish 
um, votes. And you can see also the, where the votes break down very much along the lines of the um, Remain and Leave campaign. So what problem areas emerge if you want to leave an area that you've been part of since 1973, um, where you've developed deep economic and political ties, where you've got common policies that you now want to diverge from? Well, in terms of trade, Britain's going to have to come up with new trade agreements, not least with the European Union itself, where 53% of British trade goes. Now, previously, there had been no barriers to trade. It would be like trading with you know, Maryland or New Jersey from Pennsylvania. Things could go quite um, um, smoothly within Europe. Also, the European Union sets its own external tariff policy. So the European Union negotiated trade deals, and there were some British officials who helped, along with German officials and French and Lithuanian, to negotiate these international trade deals. But there was no British trade negotiators um, not of the number that you need to negotiate your own trade agreements. So they didn't have any real you know, skill set in this beyond the handful that had been attached to the European Union. But that's only a handful compared to the vast array that one of the world's largest economies would have to negotiate. And keep in mind, they have to negotiate not just with the Europeans, but with the Americans and the, the Canadians and the Japanese and the Koreans and pretty much everyone else. You don't get European you don't get to take part in the European deals. You're independent of that. So you've got to negotiate your own. This was argued to be one of the advantages that the choices the European Union would make were sometimes detrimental, it was felt, to the British economy. The European trade deals would tend to prioritize you know, the interests of French farmers. Britain doesn't have a big agriculture sector. So Britain is much less likely to find a trade-off that benefits French farmers is very attractive. By the same token, the European Union itself is a relatively wealthy, high per capita income area. So there was a lot of commonality in what sort of agreements people would like. The second area is immigration. There were millions of European citizens, EU citizens, who'd freely lived in the UK prior to the vote for Brexit, and coming up with some arrangement of how to deal with them was on the works as well. Plus, there were several hundred thousand, I think about 600,000 British expats living in Europe, in, you know, southern France and Spain, the sort of sunny climes one could not get in the United Kingdom. And what would happen to them? They, interestingly, by the way, were not allowed to vote in the UK referendum, although they clearly had an interest. It was only for residents Engl you know, British citizen residents of the United Kingdom. There are other areas like Gibraltar, which is only tens of thousands of people, but it's a British overseas uh, territory of affiliate. It voted overwhelmingly to remain, but this would reopen a historical can of worms going back to you know, 1713 and the Treaty of Utrecht when Britain got Gibraltar from Spain. Spain had always wanted it back. But with being both members of the European Union and having common borders that people could go back and forth across, the issue of sovereignty was much less pressing than it suddenly becomes if there's a border between the United Kingdom, Gibraltar, and the, um, uh, and the Kingdom of Spain and the European Union. There'd also be issues relating to security. If you're caring about the civil liberties of British citizens, just sharing their information with what's now a different, um, organ, you know, different um, political entity, the European Union, might be problematic. So what would be the relationship with Europol or police cooperation, anti-terrorism, and even NATO? How does that fit in now that Britain's not part of the European Union-based activities? There had been activities in, say, Sierra Leone, where Britain had interests that Britain could enter into under a European flag. But if they had to enter under a British flag, it might have gotten awkward because in Sierra Leone they weren't as keen on the British. Um, and the French did very similar things in West Africa and so forth. If they could put a European flag and a European helmet on, it looked a whole lot better than if the French flag or the British or Italian flags showed up. So that was a bit of a, a problem there. 
And then there were the issues of what the financial obligations of Britain would be. Britain had been contributing to a whole range of European projects, everything from you know, European space agencies. There were thousands of British employees of European institutions who were owed salaries and pensions. Um, the EU budgets had been set and Britain had agreed to contribute for several years on out. And so how, you know, they, they'd committed to that through 2022. So how is that going to work now that Britain is suddenly going to pull back from being in the European Union? These all had to be negotiated. And then the most troublesome issue of all, and the real sticking point, is Ireland, which has always been a plague on British politics going back to the, um, well, before the 19th century, but within Westminster. And the same story often has repeated itself, where a British government somehow in, finds itself relying upon support from Irish parties to stay in power. And in the 19th and early 20th centuries, the demands of the Irish parties were home rule or independence. And now, of course, they have equal demands, but pulling in different directions. The Protestant Ulster Unionist Party, Democratic Unionist Party, wants to have a very, you know, we're clearly part of the United Kingdom. Don't come up with any agreement that makes it look like we're part of the Irish Republic and hence not part of the European Union. And Catholic Northern, residents of Northern Ireland would say, well now, you know, we've had, the, you know, for quite some time now, we've had free movement back and forth. If you put up a hard border there, you're cementing the idea once again that Ireland is divided that it's a Protestant Ireland, Catholics are second class, and that this could risk reigniting the troubles. And membership in the European Union had been a major feature in alleviating troubles in Northern Ireland. If you don't have a border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, because everyone's in the European Union, you can move back and forth freely, um, uh, then it becomes much less of a concern for the Protestants because you can move back and forth from Liverpool or London to Ireland just as easily, so you're still part of the UK. And for the Catholics, the sting of not being part of the Irish Republic is also removed as well, because you can go back and forth relatively easily. But if you start erecting hard borders and having other institutions like that, restrictions on trade and migration, this suddenly brings those agreements into question and brings back problems that, in, that you thought had been largely resolved back in 1998. And just to give you an I idea, I mean, this is, this is the leader of the, uh, uh, former leader of the um, Ulster, Un uh, the uh, DUP, Democratic Unionist Party, Ian Paisley. He was elected to the European Parliament. John Paul II is speaking, and he would, he would hold up a sign, you know, John Paul II is the Antichrist. Um, I, I, I take it quite quite seriously, um, and um, you know, and, and if anyone has been, to, I mean, still, I, I should have included this one, but it was just a friend of mine was out in uh, St. Louis recently, and he took a picture from a Irish bar that he went into, and it had pictures of, um, uh, of 10 Irish Republican Army prisoners who had uh, fasted to death around 1979, 1980, if you remember Bobby Sands and the others. And this was, you know, we will remember our boys and our victory will be, you know, complete. And that's in an Irish bar in the United States. Um, and it certainly is felt very deeply and in, in Ireland as well. And the political agreements of the late 90s and early 2000s had sought to and had largely been successful in moving past that. And so this would risk putting those up again. So how do you deal with Northern Ireland? And this is just a, a cartoon that, you know, lots of the other ones could be negotiated out. You could, you know, they, the, the answers could be more or less favorable, but the Irish one was a pretty uh, a big one. Of how do you get by that? What arrangement do you have in Northern Ireland and with Ireland? So this is, becomes quite, quite problematic. And the government of Theresa May that's torn over how to implement this sort of agreement with, uh, you know, what, what sort of arrangements can you have in Ireland? And all these others, you can see there are different sorts of Brexits. Um, the, uh, there's the Remain, which lost, right? But once you're out of the European Union, 
got a whole list of countries there that are not part of the European Union, and they all have different institutional arrangements with Europe relating to different areas. If you, know, if you wanted to have you know, an independent trade policy and, and get a trade agreement with them, well, Norway has that. But Norway also follows a lot of European regulations. Um, they essentially just say, well, you know, we're a small country. It's better for us just to take whatever regulations the Europeans make and follow them. And we'll go along with that and we'll be, be competitive. But we won't have to pay really any of the prices for that. But this was going against the idea that Britain would be its own independent country. What's the point of sovereignty if you have to, if the Europeans are going to set rules? Previously, you got to take part and be an important part of making European rules. You'd really be a colony and a vassal if you did what Norway did. So a lot of people didn't like that idea. Now, Switzerland had you know, more, you know, more autonomy that the European Court of Justice wasn't the arbiter of whether they were following the rules. But even so, Switzerland largely um, um, allows for free movement of individuals with Europe and um, other you know, uh, uh, elements. Um, the Ukraine has different arrangements, as does Turkey. But the interesting part with Turkey is they're part of the European Customs Union. So the Labor Party sort of liked this. They could say, well, we'll keep the same trade deals, because that's a real big thing, negotiating out hundreds of trade deals. Um, we could be like Turkey. The Euro we'll let the Europeans negotiate a trade deal, and we'll just latch on to that. And maybe we can make an arrangement to take part. But again, those who said, no, 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 you know, we need to be able to prioritize British industries British sectors of the economy. We don't want to be having something where the, you know, the, those French farmers or those Polish farmers or, or you know, German automakers are getting an advantage that we don't. So that was unattractive there. It was felt that an arrangement that, you know, the, uh, uh, like Canada or South Korea, where, you know, wealthy countries that have their own um, um, trade policies, this would probably be the real model because you get to do all the things that you would want to do. So that would be, you know, what the best version of Brexit, of Brexit um, would be. Now, here's our map of what the, or, uh, of what the uh, government of Theresa May had to deal with. You know, she's got 326 needed for majority. She's won 317. There's the Democratic Unionist. But then she's got a problem that is within the conservative parties. I've talked before, there are some real hardcore Eurosceptics, but they're also a big element, like David Cameron and others within the Conservative Party, who really would wanted European integration. That they didn't like what was happening, um, and they were against it. At the same time, there was a wing of the party that really, you know, come hell or high water, they wanted out. Um, they didn't care what the deal was. Just the sooner we were out, the better. And if you have no deal, then we're out no deal. And we'll just let the chips fall where they may without any agreements. We'll just be free and independent, and you know, things will default to what were relatively undesirable international standards. But you'd prefer to have an agreement about things rather than come up with, let's say, a hard border between Ireland and Northern Ireland, for instance. So they're your hardcore Eurosceptics. And that, they were sort of their slogan was, you know, it's Brexit or bust. You know, we will not vote for anything that um, would continue to tie us to European institutions. Do not be saying that we'll be having, you know, a trade policy with Europe or that we'll follow the single market rules or, or that there'll be a long transition period. You know, out means out is what their position was. The problem, of course, is the Conservative government, when you've got this many, Things happen to members of parliament. You know, some of them get involved in scandals, drunk driving. Um, they, you lose people to by-elections. Sometimes they really decide they don't like you, um, and they leave the party and become independent. Um, sometimes you know they defect to the Liberal Democrats. They say, you know, look, the Liberal Democrats are a European party. That's really what I believe. I'm out. Um, some of them you know, get suspended. Um, this includes, by the way, Boris Johnson's brother. Um, so some, some family drama going on um, there as well. And then one member resigned. So you're really down to a core of about 200 party loyalists who vote for whatever you give them. You know, 200 conservatives will vote for whatever you can give. But the rest of them, 
they're not necessarily compatible with each other. And this causes um, a great deal of, of frustration. Um, and ultimately, um, you know, Theresa May keeps putting forward different versions, and they all get voted down for one reason or another. Quite massively, the, the, the biggest defeats of a British government in the post-war period all came in this period of time under Theresa May as she desperately tried to get agreements on arrangements for Northern Ireland or various other uh, elements of her European plan. Now within this time period, another European parliamentary election takes place and you can see here what the problem is. A new party forms, the Brexit party, really out of the UK Independence Party, Nigel Farage is the leader of it, and, and you can see how closely they map the vote for Brexit, um, where the Leave candidate, you know, areas that voted for Leave voted for Brexit in these European elections with a proportional system. And it turns out that, so that they win the election, they're the biggest vote gainer. The Liberal Democrats, who run on an unabashedly Remain platform, we should have another referendum about any agreement and we should stay in, they come in second. Labor's a very distant third. Um, the Conservatives are pushed behind the Green Party, down to 8.8%. You know, They're the governing party, and they get one vote in 12. So you can see very much why they're anxious about the threat from, the Bre from people who favored um, leaving the European Union. Parties that had pledged themselves to having a second referendum, they say, okay, you know, look, fine, you've got your deal, you want to get out of um, the you know, European Union, but whatever deal you come up with, some deals are more desirable than others. If, you know, uh, so we should vote on whether the deal we have is a good one. Um, and 53% of the parties, of, of the votes go to those parties that say whatever the, now again, they don't necessarily agree, right, on what that good deal should be, but they wanted to have a referendum on what the result was. Turns out, actually, that um, the Brexit party is the largest single party in the European Parliament. So they got uh, the largest share of the vote in one of the major members. Um, other parties in Germany and elsewhere didn't do as well. So the single largest European, U Parla U European parliamentary party with, um, uh, is the Brexit party, which is, of course, pledged to leave. Well, at this point, Boris Johnson finally manages to be able to get an election for our parliament, and he has a very simple message, is get Brexit done. By this point, people are pretty exhausted and annoyed by the whole issue. It's been dragging on now for the better part of, of three years, and his message is, we're gonna go out. I campaign to leave. I'm the guy who can deliver it. If you vote for the conservatives, then we will take you out, and if we don't have a deal, we're just gonna be out. And that was designed to appeal to the Brexit party which decided not to stand in seats where the conservatives were running. They also largely purged from the conservative party and from their candidates any conservative candidates who did not back leaving. So that group of uh, pro-Europeans was pushed out of the uh, conservative parliamentary um, party. And so at this point, you do get a reestablishment of that electoral system that I talked about to begin with. Here were things in 2017, and now here's 2019. The conservatives only get 43% of the vote. The parties that are pledged to a second re referendum get 52% of the vote, but they're all divided up. And so the conservatives with 43%, which is not much more than they got two years before, are able to win a very substantial majority. This is what Theresa May had wanted two years before, a solid majority where if people decide to defect on you, you can ignore them and you don't have to rely upon the um, Irish. And the Labor Party, which took a very ambiguous position because it was quite internally divided. Elements on the left in the Labor Party wanted to leave the um, European Union they wanted out of that capitalist Europe, but the Labor Party wanted to oppose the conservatives. So they decided they would you know, take perhaps too clever an idea by half that we're, you know, we'll favor Brexit, but we'll have a referendum. And then their hope was they would win the, you know, the leadership would, or some of the leaders would um, uh, wanted to defeat 
any, any um, uh, Brexit uh, deal. The, they also hamper the fact that the leader of their party, Jeremy Corbyn, was very staunchly anti-European from that left wing of the party that felt Europe was a capitalist cabal. So you can see here, again, the Scottish nationalists do quite well, and they run very clearly on, you know, Europe is best for Scotland, and this is a very bad deal, and this is what happens when you let those English people run the show. And, um, and they did quite well, but obviously not enough to uh, uh, carry, carry the day. Conservatives get a very substantial majority. And so this puts several of the issues off to the side, that they're able to push through an agreement um, um, but it's, that um, might not be as palatable as the Irish would have wanted, but it's an agreement that um, they could pass through Parliament without Irish support. It would have a you know, UK trade policy. Um, but what happens in Ireland? Well, in Northern Ireland, they have the UK trade policy, but because they want goods to keep going back and forth across the border, the UK would collect EU customs on goods going into Northern Ireland, um, especially if they felt they were you know, at risk of straying into uh, uh, the uh, Southern Republic. So Ireland is sort of in both worlds. It's in the United Kingdom. It's with it, subject to UK trade policy, but Britain is making arrangements to facilitate it still being within the uh, single uh, market. Likewise, the UK now can develop its own rules, which will increasingly diverge over time from the Europeans. Um, but Northern Ireland is subject to EU regulations with the proviso that the Northern Ireland Assembly every four years gets to vote on whether to stay or leave from those European rules. And if a majority decides to leave, then they would go straight to the British rules. Uh, Boris Johnson's advertised this as Ireland's got the best deal, Northern Ireland's got the best deal possible. They, you know, they've got to be in the single market and they get to have trade with um, you know, the European Union. And of course, the, the rejoinder to that was, well, if that's such a good deal, why wasn't it such a good deal for the rest of the United Kingdom? And the Scottish say, why, why can't we have that deal as well? Um, but um, the risk is that um, four years in the future, eight years in the future, a you know, a Protestant majority might vote to leave, or alternatively, and for the first time in the most recent elections for the Northern Ireland Assembly, there's a majority of, of the uh, 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 nationalists, the Catholic nationalist parties, pro-unification in the Irish Assembly. And that's never happened before. So that would open up a series of problems as well in exactly the opposite direction. And then there are issues of security, that if um, one of your concerns was about migration and people coming in, well, then you want to, if you've got this open border with Europe in Ireland, how are you going to be monitoring that, especially if mi migrants have this tendency to try to slip in on trucks and things? Probably you could control that at Calais with additional checks, but if they're just driving back and forth from Belfast and Dublin, then you'd want to be able to monitor things there. So, if you can't monitor them on the Irish border, there's one other place you can monitor it. It says they leave Northern Ireland and come into the mainland of the UK. But you can see there why well, the Protestants might not like that, because you've effectively made a border for migration in the Irish Sea. And so Ireland is now, in that sense, outside the um, European, or outside the United Kingdom. So there are tensions within it, but the majority the Conservatives have enables them to effectively ignore it. There's still tensions, they'll still be there, but they can ignore it. And so that brings us to Brexit Day, which just occurred a few weeks ago. And here are all of the uh, 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 headlines from the various um, papers. The Guardian, which is really the only left-wing paper in the United Kingdom, um, doesn't really like it. You know, puts it up as, you know, we're a small island, now we're isolated. Um, the uh, Scottish don't really like it either, and, uh, um, but lots of the others do. You know, it's a new dawn for Britain, our time has come, that sort of, of thing. Now, one of the big debates that, or the rhetorical elements that have been underway for the Johnson government have been, you know, they, they want to provide some sort of model for what Brexit will look like for, um, 
you know, for, for, for Britain. You know, who will we be like? Um, because if we're not going to be like Germany, you know, the hated Germans, who are we going to be like? And Canada and Australia tend to be the big examples, you know, independent, English-speaking, you know, former um, colonies and dominions, kind of, you know, high per capita income. That has some, some appeal. But if you look at what sort of institutions Britain's selected, it's not, they're not either Canada or Australia. Now, here I've got all the flags of Europe in this very convoluted mess of European institutions, which are all very much overlapping. Um, part of what is very interesting about European debates is you're selecting a degree of international institutions to be a part of. Um, you know, and different countries have made different choices as to which institutions they're part of in the economic and security realm. At the core is the European Union itself, but some of those members use the euro, some don't. Um, some of the movement of individuals, like between Switzerland and Norway, occurs without borders, but they're not members of the European Union, but they still see advantages in free movement. Um, some of them are part of security agreements and others aren't. So Britain, which you can see right there, it's off center and the center right, is in the European Union, but not in the Eurozone. They still keep the pound. And a lot of people argued, well, all these exemptions Britain has sort of indicates we're sort of half out of the European Union anyway. So this isn't too much of a broader step. So that's not the part of Europe they're in. That's not their flag. Um, and they voted out of the European Union, so Britain's not there anymore either. OK, so what else is Britain voted itself out of? Well, what they call the uh, Schengen area, that's the area of free movement of people. Because they're concerned about migration. They want controls there, an island, um, easier to control things. So not part of the Schengen area either. Now, got a small little bit up there for the customs union. Um, Britain wants its own trade policy. So you're not part of that either. So what does that leave you? Where, you know, you're still a member of the security organizations, NATO, and the Council of Europe, and the, you know, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe. So where does Britain fall? Who are they? Well, there they are. Uh, does anyone know who they are? Oh, come on. Na NATO's newest member, Albania. So oh, now that is obviously not going to appeal to the British citizen. The, the, the Albanian option does not sound like an English-speaking, high-tech, you know, high-income country. Um, you know, they're sort of fractious mountain people. So this is not really what the uh, uh, British have in, have in mind. But institutionally, that's what they've uh, uh, chosen. And interestingly, Albania is on track to join the European Union because Albania sees the track to European Union membership, like many of the uh, countries of Eastern Europe, as the path to modernization, political um, stabilization, and economic growth. So what issues do, do we have? Well, still got to come up with a free trade deal with the European Union. And this is pretty important. Who's going to get you know, their interests traded away and who's going to get their uh, benefits? And this is a pretty important one. The uh, British have a variety of sectors that they rely a great deal upon. The uh, financial services sector is uh, you know, over a million people in the city of London. $130 billion a year. So Britain's going to want to have free access to be selling financial goods and services within Europe. British agriculture, not so much, although British farmers like things. Britain's not really an agricultural country. And one of the sticking points Britain had always had with the European Union was the British felt that, you know, in some, in some ways the European Union, which spent more than half its money on the Common Agricultural Party, was really an agricultural support program masquerading as an international organization, funneling money to French and German and Italian farmers at the expense of the British, who didn't have many farmers. So Britain might trade off the farmers some, but Britain's very concerned about some elements uh, are, uh, of, of farming. And if they come up with a trade deal with the United States and um, start allowing in, say, genetically modified organisms, then this will put in jeopardy various arrangements with the Europeans because um, when you let in genetically modified products, which Europe currently doesn't, um, they, you know, they have a way of transferring themselves around, whether you 
want to or not. As an island country, Britain's pretty sensitive to that, but Ireland is pretty sensitive to it as well. So if you got varieties of genetically modified corn or something in Northern Ireland, that would pretty quickly stray into the Southern Republic and so forth. So there are issues there of potential consequences of what Britain might run into. There's also fisheries. Britain's a maritime power. It's got a lot of sea coast. It's strategically located, so there's lots of area where there could be fishing. But Britain, again, doesn't have a lot of fishers. There's about 10,000 of them, and it's a $1 billion a year industry. So compared to the financial services, pretty small. But France, Spain, Norway, and others have a lot of interest in fishing. In fact, fishing is one of the reasons Norway has stayed out of the European Union. Um, so how will that get traded off? Um, they'd be concerned there. Also, the, whether or not you know, people get medical degrees in the UK, will they be able to practice on the continent? Will others be able to practice in Britain? This is one of the things that had been allowed before, but would now be brought into some, some question. And so Britain would have to figure out how to deal with that. The default is that you don't recognize other people's qualifications. They're not yours. So why would the British Medical Association necessarily think the Greek Medical Association had certified a good doctor? Now, at the moment, they do, but they need not. And then, of course, movement of individuals. This is, of course, one of the big ones and major ones about migration that Britain had been concerned about. Um, and the British would like to be able to move back and forth, but they're not so keen on other people. Here's a, a, a Twitter, this a thing that went viral a few days ago of a um, pro-Brexit supporter at, waiting at the airport in Amsterdam who's uh, furious because he had to stand in the immigration line, which is, of course, not what you used to have to do when Britain wasn't in, when Britain was in the European Union. You'd go through the European line, right? Well, lo and behold, this fellow said, so I'm 55 minutes for some bureaucrat to stamp my you know, thing to, to, to get in. This isn't the Brexit I voted for. I think this is the British version of take your government hands off my Medicare. So Britons want to be able to go freely to Spain and elsewhere, but they're not so keen on having people come in free freely into the UK, but obviously the European Union would want to have some form of reciprocal arrangement. And then, of course, there are issues of separatism in Scotland and Northern Ireland. The Scottish nationalists have gone straight up and said, hey, when we voted to stay in, we voted to stay in the European Union. You guys have shredded the rule book, changed the game, and now all of a sudden we want to do things differently. And by the way, a lot of these other things you're putting through are not in our interest. Scotland has a declining population domestically. Their death rate is higher than their birth rate. Rural areas are being depopulated. And if Britain puts in, if the United Kingdom puts in their proposed migration policy, which makes sense for the City of London and financial services to say, hey, we only want to attract high income earners who are making above a certain amount, otherwise they'll be pushing people out of jobs, that might be good if you're in London. But if you're in Scotland, you're losing people in your rural community. You've got an aging population. What you need are younger care workers where the average salary is 15,000 pounds a year. Putting a barrier like that up when previously you'd been getting people from Lithuania or Poland or elsewhere coming in under, you know, within Europe to help bridge that gap, provide care, that suddenly becomes a problem for Scotland. Scotland's interests are divergent from those of the United Kingdom as a whole, and they suffer the same issues that the British, writ large, felt they suffered within the United Kingdom, that a central government is making decisions that are having a very negative impact on them, and that it might matter and make sense for the whole entity, but it doesn't make much sense for them. So if they had their own government in Scotland, fueled by oil revenues so, uh, or, or wind farms, um, that Scotland would be able to set its own immigration policy, could have a Scottish visa, people could come in, they could, they could build a wall, which by the way would start in Carlisle, UK, on Hadrian's Wall and, uh, and, and go across, and that they too could have a policy that fit their purposes. So separatism is an issue that can come up as well. And those are the sorts of issues that 
have arisen from this. Um, we still have to see how things play out. At the end of this year, they're due to, they have a timeline for negotiating a trade agreement. It's unlikely to be met. And then we'll see whether they give themselves extensions or otherwise make additional arrangements. But that's sort of how I wanted to lay things out for where things stand with Brexit, where it came from, and what sort of tensions we might see going forward. So with that, I'll turn it over to you for questions.